All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our well-being workshops. This month in March, we are talking about different types of well-being in general. Uh, and I uh, wanted to focus specifically on gut health this month. So I'm excited to get started in talking about all of that. Our gut health. So, you know, we could talk about gut health for hours. So to keep it to just under 30 minutes, I am going to just mostly focus a brief overview about what I mean about gut health and then how we can eat for gut health, which includes the inclusion of prebiotics and probiotic rich foods. I will not be touching on probiotic supplements or even prebiotic supplements because they exist too, just because again, that could be its own conversation. And as a dietitian, I definitely want to you know promote food first. Uh, but if you've been recommended to take a probiotic, certainly this does not um, you know prevent you from doing things like that. But we'll talk about food sources today. So what really do we mean by gut health? What do I mean today? So you may also hear this referred to as digestive health, but it's really just the health of your entire gastrointestinal or GI tract. Some people think of it as just their stomach. Some people think of it just their intestines. But really, when we think about gut health, we're kind of thinking the whole up and down. Uh, the health of this system is really important. And one of the reasons we wanted to include it in our, uh, let me see, somebody wants the... I think I added the um, captions. If they did not work, I am so sorry. I'm not sure. Let me pause. Okay. So for the health of our overall body, our gut health is super important. And you've probably heard this before. Uh, you know, how our gut is functioning can have implications for our overall well-being, including immunity, mental health, the risk of prevention of and management of different health conditions and diseases. So these things can include heart disease, diabetes, cancer, various things. And again, I didn't mention this, but this is something I think should be included in this conversation is that we're learning more and more about the gut microbiome and our gut health and the implications of it every day. And it is still a science that is in its infancy. So if you see people who think they have it all figured out, they very likely do not. And they're probably trying to sell you something. So often you probably hear us in our conversation say, you know what, it depends, or we're not sure. This is kind of that. What we do know is that certain strains of the things I'm going to talk about are probably helpful, but it's also very unique to the individual, which we'll mention too. Something that works for one person might not work for another person because of how unique our microbiomes are, which honestly to me is kind of cool. Uh, one thing about gut health, like I mentioned, it's largely influenced by the gut microbiome, which again, can vary person to person, not can, will vary person to person. And depending on different stages of your life, if you have had certain conditions, if you've taken an antibiotic, so many things can affect that. Uh, so we're gonna get into a little bit more detail. In terms of the microbiome and microbiota, they are not exactly interchangeable terms. We really think of the microbiome as kind of the whole system, and microbiota are those organisms that you see here. So like the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi, so like the yeasts, and different protozoa. So there are tons of living organisms within our gut. We also have a microbiome on us as well and in different parts, but we're focusing predominantly on the gut flora. What do they do? In our guts, the bacteria, viruses, all of these living, well, viruses aren't living, but you know, these things, they help do a lot for our bodies and functions that we need them to do. Many of them are good. Of course, we know ones are not so good. So we're going to try by eating various foods to incorporate more of those good guys because they help us make certain vitamins. So things like B12 and other things we have to synthesize in our gut and things like good probiotics can help with that. They help us digest our food. They're actually doing a majority of that process in our stomachs and in our GI tract, and they can protect our immune system as well. So super important stuff. Now, what affects our microbiome? Now, these are just some 
things. These are not an all-inclusive list, but our age, you know, affects so many parts of our health, our lifestyle. So whether it be alcohol, physical activity, if we do it or not, uh, lifestyle can also include nutrition or diet. Medications can play a big factor into how our gut is functioning. So sometimes we need to take medications and it's not really something we can change, but it may be having an effect on our gut health. Again, like the antibiotics, we need to kill the bad bacteria wherever it may be in our body, but antibiotics don't always know not to, or they can't, they can't not kill the good bacteria too. So there's a lot of things that can affect it. Different disease states. So again, things like diabetes can affect our gut microbiome. And that's where a lot of the research is being done. And then genetics. So your own genetics, epigenetics, which is kind of the genetics that are passed down. You know, the egg that formed you was in your mother, was in your grandmother and things that they did or didn't do have an effect on your DNA as well. Also, one that I find fascinating is whether or not you were born via cesarean section or a vaginal birth can affect your microbiome. Just like fascinating stuff. Um, and of course, you cannot change some of these things, but like every other lifestyle factor, there are things you can change and things that you can't. So we want to focus on the things that we can change, like our diet. Again, when we're talking about gut health, GI health, we're kind of looking at the whole system. Today, we'll predominantly be looking at the intestines because that's kind of where we focus on talking about. There are so many different digestive diseases that are out there, different disorders, things from constipation, acid reflux, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel, oops, says bowel, <laughs> bowel syndrome, diverticular disease like diverticulitis or diverticulosis, ulcerative colitis, various infections, like there are so many gut issues that could occur. And again, this is not meant for, you know, to diagnose or to help you, you know, manage any of these particular conditions. If these are of concern, please do reach out to a GI specialist because that's what they're there for. Now, what are some things that we may be doing that can lead to an unhealthy gut or maybe just an imbalance? Poor dietary habits. And that's what we're going to focus on today because that's my specialty. Uh, but poor dietary habits, that can include not consuming enough fiber or water, not having a good balance of consuming those probiotic and prebiotic rich foods we'll mention. People who have increased alcohol use or people who smoke may have an unhealthy gut flora if we do not exercise enough. But sometimes people who exercise too much, you know, you know either side of the spectrum can't, is not always good. Insufficient sleep and stress. So a lot of times GI symptoms, especially things like IBS symptoms, absolutely dietary approaches are very important, but sometimes stress, just the different things that that causes can lead to a lot of GI symptoms. So lots of different factors to consider. But there are reasons to try to change all of those factors one at a time, you know, within your means. Uh, because a healthy gut is really important. And I've mentioned a lot of these before, but just to reiterate, enhanced immune function, improved digestion and absorption of different nutrients. If our gut is not functioning properly, we're not going to absorb, absorb all of those nutrients we're consuming. So you may be deficient in certain things. Regular bowel movements, which we all want, whether or not we want to talk about it. Weight management, especially we're consuming foods that are high in fiber. Uh, so that's a benefit healthy skin complexion, I think that's how that's spelled, uh, many uh, reduced risks of different diseases, and then boosts energy and mood potentially as well. So lots of good benefits. Now, we're going to talk again ex exclusively about probiotics and prebiotics today as our main focus. So we have probiotics, which really are those live microorganisms that I mentioned that this is the definition. <laughs> when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. So you are the host. Uh, and we need to consume these probiotics in a high enough quantity. So, you know, just a little bit is not going to be enough. We don't fully know a lot. And again, this is where that science is in its infancy, where you're going to see, you know, these colony forming units. So CFUs, you might see on these various products. And the research is getting there, we're learning more and more about the amount of probiotics we need to consume, but 
the current moment, we don't fully know what the um, adequate amount is for every single type of probiotic, but we want to make sure we're eating them every day. They are fragile, so they can be vulnerable to heat and stomach acid. So that's one of the hardest pieces is that like we take these probiotic supplements or maybe they're in our foods that we consume, but they have to be able to make it through the stomach acid or the processing of the food. So a lot of times you'll see food products have added probiotics because they had to be pasteurized. So let's say it's a yogurt product or something. It's pasteurized. That heat process will kill the probiotics that were in there to begin with. So they're often added back in, which is good. We still need them. Uh, they can help uh, fight the harmful bacteria that are present in our gut. So again, we've got good guys and not so good guys. And those probiotics are measured in colony forming units. I do have a poll. I want to see if I can if I can get it to work. I'm going to launch our poll. So if you want to answer, it says, do you consume probiotic rich foods every day? Keynote being every day. Yes, every day. Yes, most days. And no, no judgments. I made it anonymous. I'm not going to see your answers because for me, you know what? I'm going to say, yeah, most days. But then there are some days I forget to eat my yogurt or whatever food I want that day. Somebody asked in the chat, which is better for us, prebiotic or probiotic? That is a great question that I hope I am going to answer through the next couple slides or that maybe you'll be able to tell me the answer for. All right, I am going to end our poll. And this is something, again, we didn't only really know about probiotics. Uh, but again, it's a pretty new thing that we're learning about. They're not new, <laughs> but um, most of us, yeah, we're between the yeah, most days or no. And for the eight of you who said yes every day, I am so, so proud. You're doing your gut a quite a service, but it's hard to, you know, remember to consume these foods every day. But I did want to emphasize that everyday piece because when you go to the bathroom, number two, all of those, you know, not all, but a lot of those live active cultures, all of that bacteria is going out with it. You need to keep replenishing it. And that's why every day is a good reminder. And there are tons of different foods that have probiotics or cultures or all of those, you know, uh, things I had mentioned. So yogurt and kefir, so that fermented yogurt beverage that we sell, we have a store brand. Uh, those are two of the most common foods that people think about when they think about probiotics. You see that like live active culture on the label. That's just the easiest one to think of. And there are non-dairy yogurts that include those live and active cultures. So it does not have to be a milk product if you cannot have or do not consume milk. Sauerkrauts, pickled vegetables, kimchi. You do want to look for ones that call out the fact that they have live active cultures because again, when we go through that, you know, pasteurization process or whatever, sometimes we do inadvertently kill that good bacteria. Although I will say, even if you don't have the live probiotics there, um, they will still be beneficial. <gasps> Yes, absolutely. Kombucha. I don't know where I had kombucha on the list. I must have accidentally deleted it. Thank you. Yes, kombucha. And I believe my next slide will have a picture of kombucha. But yes, kombucha, tempeh, which is a um, like fermented soy product, miso, also a fermented uh, soy product, some types of olives, sourdough breads. This is another good example. It's a fermented food, but we're often eating sourdough bread once it's been baked. So we are killing off a lot of those probiotics, but we're getting some benefit from the fermented food itself. Aged cheeses, and then often they are added to foods. So some fermented cheeses, um, things that are aged like blue cheeses, which people don't tend to like, uh, but they are my favorites. So these are some food products you can find in our stores. Not every store will carry each product, um, so you'll just have to check with your individual stores. But um, no, I, let me. Go, I don't know if I can go back. Um, these are not listed from most to least in terms of the amount of probiotics. They may inadvertently be, but no. Like yes, the yogurt kefirs are going to have a lot that are alive currently. Um, but no, this is in no particular order. This is just the order as I was thinking of them. I wrote them down and forgot kombucha. I can't believe that. That's one of the first ones I think about. Uh, I would recommend trying to consume at least one food product that has probiotics every day. If you're not consuming foods like these 
today, I would start slowly because they can, you know, they're going to confer a health benefit. They're going to cause your GI tract to, you know, have more of these probiotic strains and that could cause some GI symptoms inadvertently. So I would go slow if you're not in including them yet. Uh, but a serving a day to start would be great. And that could be, you know, half of a bottle of kombucha, a cup of kefir, a cup of yogurt. I love these chia seeds that have the probiotics because like I'm already going to eat chia seeds. Might as well just use the ones that have probiotics added because uh, they're so easy to add to things like cooked oatmeal. Again, I would add them after the oatmeal has been cooked so that you don't kill the probiotics that are in there. This is the farmhouse culture uh, sauerkraut. They will have live active cultures in there, unlike some sauerkrauts. And then we do, my, my giants don't carry these. I haven't found it yet. But we do have a nature's promise uh, granola that has a prebiotic blend or probiotic blend added to it. So just some fun products. Again, there are plenty of products uh, in the store, other types of yogurts, but uh, these are just some fun ones I thought I would share. Another one I wanted to share a product that we're highlighting this month is our Chobani Zero line. Uh, it does call out six different live and active cultures that it contains. Uh, so things like, I'm not the best at pronouncing these, I'm not going to lie, acidophilus, bifidus, uh, just ones you've probably seen on different yogurts. But the fact that they call out six different live and active ones is a great sign. Additionally, some benefits of this yogurt compared to others, it has no added sugar and it is lactose free. And that tends to be true of a lot of products that have probiotics. Those live active cultures in there are actively breaking down that lactose sugar because they need food. And a lot of the products will be naturally lactose free anyway. Uh, they are a good source of protein and they're all under 70 calories. So a really easy, you know, and lower calorie food to add to your day to add some probiotics. Somebody said they swapped out sour cream for yogurt when cooking to increase my intake. Absolutely. A dollop of Greek yogurt instead of sour cream, so it'd be lower calorie, higher protein, and you're getting those probiotic benefit. And it really doesn't taste all that different. I love it. That's one of the easiest swaps. Someone said they love Chobani Zero. Zero. I do too. I like the, um, oh, these are my two favorite flavors, which is why I included the pictures. Someone said, are the probiotics uh, that are in the chia seed similar to probiotics taken in a pill form? They may be similar strains, but every probiotic pill form is going to have different strains. Um, so it is sort of like a supplement since you're adding it to foods, but it is still a food product. Is the sauerkraut you get in the bags in the meat section better than the ones in the cans? They're both great foods, but even the ones in bags, depending on what the brand is, they might not have the live active cultures. Um, you'd have to read the label to see if the cultures are still live because a lot of times they've been pasteurized, which is a good process, but it will kill the uh, probiotic uh, in the food product. Sauerkraut is still great. It's still going to be a fermented product. It's still going to have fiber, um, but it might just not have the probiotics left. They might not be alive anymore. I believe the Chobani Zero has monk fruit and stevia as the sweeteners. So two naturally occurring ones. Other foods, and this is again, not meant to be health advice, uh, but what they have found, again, research is slowly growing in this area, but there are certain probiotic strains that might have potential specific benefits. So, oh, it's allulose. You're right. There's allulose in the Chobani Zero as well, which I think tastes pretty good. So in terms of constip constipation, B. lactis, which is found in things like Activia, which I love. Honestly, this, if you want something simple to increase your probiotics every day, these Activia probiotic dailies are perfect. They're so small, just kind of like soup, on the go, really easy. The Good Belly is also like a juice drink that has probiotics. And again, in terms of constipation, they have been proven to help with that. Uh, IBS, there may be some benefit in these good belly beverages as well. And then mental health. So things like acidophilus, cassie and bifidum, which you can find in various yogurt beverages and yogurts like the Chobani Zero and Lifeway Kefir, uh, will have those as well. Uh, 
Yes. So somebody said they're looking at their um, giant, their particular giant, and they're not seeing any cheeses. I'll have to look up some. Yeah, they're probably not going to list, uh, you know, they're not going to call it out on our giant website. I personally would not look to cheeses to be my main source of probiotics in my diet because it will still come with a lot of saturated fat and sodium, uh, which can be a negative in terms of our gut health. So it would not be the first place I would look, but I will look, I will try to add into my Gmail. Um, another question, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but there was news about stevia and monk fruit that they cause heart attack and stroke. It actually was not stevia or monk fruit. It was erythritol and the study, I won't get into the exact study, but it was very poorly done. And it actually did not assess the dietary consumption of the erythritol. We actually create erythritol endogenously, meaning our bodies create erythritol. And so when we are in an inflammatory state, we, we produce a lot of it. So the study actually was not really well done, which is a good thing for us because there really is no risk for the amount we consume of these naturally occurring sugar alternatives, which stevia, monk fruit, and erythritol are. We actually find them all in fruit. Kind of cool. Now, we also have prebiotics. So prebiotics are non-digestible. So our bodies cannot break them down and they're special forms of fiber. So I know Mary talked about fiber last month. Lots of foods have fiber, which is great. We need more fiber in our diets, but prebiotics are only special types of fiber. So we need to eat enough fiber to make sure that we're getting enough of these prebiotic fibers. Again, not all dietary fibers count as prebiotics. Some that are established prebiotics include inulin, which on a food product, you might see the word inulin, fructooligosaccharides, which are shortened FOS, and then galactooligosaccharides, which are shortened GOS. If you're somebody who has IBS and has been told to follow a low FODMAP diet, these foods would kind of be off limits if they are symptomatic for you or if they cause symptoms for you. Uh, but they're really good prebiotic fibers. So for the majority of people, they can produce a health benefit. What prebiotics do or what they are, they are food for probiotics. They are food for the gut bacteria. Therefore, it's not one or the other. We don't need just probiotics. We don't need just prebiotics. We need both because they work synergistically. You know, just like we need to consume food to be alive and healthy. We need to consume prebiotics to feed the gut probiotics or gut bacteria. So we need both. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they kind of work as a gut fertilizer. I kind of liked that <laughs> terminology. And they really help the bacteria, the good bacteria thrive. And that's what we want. We want the good bacteria to outlive the bad and really confer those health benefits we talked about. There are lots of sources. They're not all foods we consume all the time. So, you know, find the ones you do consume more often and try to increase them. Things like garlic, onions, leeks, things of that family. Chicory root, another word kind of synonymous with inulin. Other types of roots that you might see in a lot of, you know, fiber rich foods nowadays. Asparagus. So, you know, a good fiber rich food. Jerusalem artichokes, which are not regular artichokes. They kind of look like little potatoes, like little nubby potatoes. I tried to find a photo. Um, I couldn't find any on our website, but I know we've sold them before. Less ripe bananas. So super yellow bananas are not going to have a lot of prebiotic fiber because that fiber has been turned more into sugar. So they taste delicious, but the prebiotic rich fiber is in that more green banana. So if you don't love green bananas, that's fine but that's just where we get a lot of prebiotic fiber. Whole oats or barley and other whole grains, ones that contain beta-glucan, which is one of the you know, heart-healthy benefits we think about with, with uh, oats and barley, but it is a, the prebiotic fiber. Apples with the skin, the pectin that's in there. Greens, especially things like dandelion greens, soybeans and other beans, and then foods that have added prebiotics as well, which I'll talk about. Somebody asked, do prebiotics also get killed by heat? They do not. Not like the same way that probiotics do, since they're like a living entity, they can be killed by heat. Fibers will not. Uh, so that's a good thing. Sometimes they can be broken down slightly, but no. Processing and things sometimes make them easier to consume. 
So no, that is perfectly fine. You can cook them, you can make a smoothie. You're not gonna disrupt them too much. Foods uh, that I just found on our website. Again, your stores may carry a different variety, but I have I tried to find a picture of greenish bananas, apples with the skin, garlic, pearl barley. Uh, this is one of my favorite products. The Go Go Squeeze, they have a line, the specific line that says happy tummies that you see here. Uh, this has prebiotic fiber added to it. So it has the apples, which already have some prebiotic fiber, but they add a little more. Mama Chia, I love these. These are a fun little squeezy pouch as well. It's just so funny, the both squeezy pouches. But this one has uh, chia seeds, and then they add some prebiotic fiber as well. Often the prebiotic fiber is inulin. So I would be super careful and just, um, you know, don't go too quickly. Like if you're not eating enough fiber right now, you want to go super slow because if you add a ton of fiber rich foods, especially ones that are rich in prebiotic fiber, you're probably going to cause a lot of gas, a discomfort, and then you're not going to want to do it. So you want to incorporate them slowly so that your GI tract can get accustomed to that fiber. Uh, someone says organic fruits for the bananas and apples. They do not have to be organic. No, whatever you buy, all will have good prebiotic fiber. And then I think uh, our team promoted these a couple months ago, but the Olapop uh, is with the natural foods. I believe they're with like our um, Nature's Promise products. Uh, in At least in my giant, there's like a whole section with these types of sodas or soda alternatives. Uh, Olapop and then Poppy are two. The Olapop has significantly more prebiotic fiber, so that's why I just included that one. I am going to launch a very similar poll. Do you think you consume enough prebiotic rich foods every day? This is a hard one. Because even if you're consuming enough fiber, you may not be consuming enough prebiotic fiber because they're not in all the foods that have fiber. Yeah, right. I have one more question at the end of the presentation. So we'll see uh, if maybe eating more prebiotic is good. Someone said easier to get if you cook at home. Absolutely. Most nutrients are easier to get if we cook at home. But, you know, that's not always an option every day. Uh, one serving. The prebiotic fiber, I think I have it on the next slide. We want to shoot for like three to five grams of, free, of prebiotic fiber a day. Sometimes it's really hard to guesstimate how much is in a product because it's not always listed. It's not something we list on the food label. Um, so trying to consume pro fiber rich foods all day, every day, like if we're hitting that, you know, 25 to 32 grams, give or take uh, a fiber a day, you're likely getting enough, but shooting for some of these in particular. All right. So here I'm going to end the poll, share the results. This is a hard one. Most of us don't consume enough fiber. So then it's really hard to get enough of the prebiotic fiber too. So thank you for being honest. It's hard. I 100% know. It. Someone said they love barley, camu, and uh, farro. I love farro too. That one's my favorite. So why? Why should we consume those prebiotic fibers in particular? Especially when we can't digest them. Like it's weird to recommend, you know, consuming a food we cannot digest but our gut bacteria can. So studies suggest, yeah, eating about three to five grams of those prebiotic fibers every day can help with our gut. Uh, prebiotics, when we consume them, the gut bacteria helps convert it to something called butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid, which is really important for our overall gut health and integrity. So butyrate, the production in the colon uh, cannot be maintained. So producing that butyrate cannot be maintained if we're not consuming an adequate amount of prebiotic fiber. Why do we care? Well, butyrate is a nutrient source for the cells that are lining our colon. So we want our colon and you know our whole GI tract to be strong and healthy because that will create a strong gut barrier, which means it's going to keep harmful substances out. You've probably heard of this like, I don't, the term leaky gut is not a real thing, but intestin intestinal permeability, so when the tight junctions that form our colon and form our GI tract, when they're not strong, things can come in and out. Butyrate is something that can help make those tight junctions, you know, tight like they're supposed to be. Uh, so it can keep out harmful substances, bacteria, viruses, things that we don't need or things that we need to get rid of. So consuming prebiotic fiber 
can be really helpful. Someone asked, can it prevent cancer? I can't say yes or no, but we have found that people that consume enough fiber-rich foods, of which prebiotic fibers are a part of, it is very important for preventing things like colon cancer. So definitely a helpful piece uh, to the puzzle. But of course, you know, cancer is such a multifactorial condition and state. So is it something that's going to harm? No, we should try it because it's so good for so many other aspects. Somebody said they've been making homemade kimchi, sauerkraut, and kombucha for at, like, at least 10 years. I love it. I'd love to try some. So, so good. Someone said, do you have to eat both types in the same meal to be useful? No, that's a really good question. So no, they don't have to be consumed at the same meal. Um, the you know probiotic bacteria and the bacteria that's already lining our colon and our intestinal tract, they're already going to be there. So the fiber, once it's coming through, they'll be able to attach. These are such great questions. This is actually my last slide. And then I have one more poll and then I will stop sharing and be open for any other questions. But first, you know, next steps, I want you just to evaluate the habits that are potentially harming your gut health. Is it stress? Is it a lack of good sleep or physical activity? Is it you're not consuming enough prebiotic or probiotic rich foods? A lot of us said that we're not, so that might be a good place to start. I want you to focus on just one habit at a time. For example, if your stress levels are just so out of control, I want you to start there before attempting to fix quote unquote anything else, because honestly, trying to incorporate any of the other things might just add another stressor. And we know that stress really can increase symptoms of things like IBS and just other gut problems. So go slow. You have plenty of time to incorporate all these things. And once you slowly incorporate them, they become a habit anyway. So slowly incorporate one. Try to consume those probiotic and prebiotic rich foods every day. Again, because you know, when you go to the bathroom, they go out with it. So we do have to you know, continuously consume these foods uh, to make sure that they can confer that health benefit we mentioned. Find ones that easily fit into your lifestyle. So if a probiotic supplement, if applicable, is good for you to do it, then follow that. But I still would recommend consuming foods that have the probiotics. So whether it be yogurts or non-dairy yogurts or foods that have them added, perfectly fine. And of course, if you have any symptoms that are GI related that have not been formally diagnosed, I do want you to consult a GI specialist, whether it be a gastroenterologist, uh, to just make sure there's nothing that's being overlooked because there can be really serious implications to not getting those things checked. So, and you could be doing yourself a disservice by, you know, just doing dietary approaches and not really getting down to the nitty gritty of what might be happening. So GI doctors are super important for that. I do have one more poll I'm going to throw up there because I think these are great questions. So I'm going to let you only choose one. So which habit will you try to adopt first to help with your gut health? probiotic rich foods, prebiotic rich foods, stress management, gentle physical activity, hydration, which I didn't even really get to talk about, and working on sleep hygiene. Someone said above, all the above deal with stress first. Absolutely. We got to deal with our stress first because we really can't focus on other aspects of our lives until we kind of work on that because other health habits can cause stress for sure. Someone said, do we get this recording and slides? Absolutely. I already had the email started and formulated. So I will send that to you as soon as really within a few minutes of hanging up. I got to upload it to YouTube, but we'll get it on there. All right. I think I'm going to end the poll. Share the results. So we got a pretty good split. Every answer was selected, but I think a lot of people are going to try to eat more probiotic rich foods, which I think is just so fantastic. But we do have a couple people who are going to work on stress management, gentle physical activity. And if you think you can handle doing more than one, that's fine. But again, don't create more of a stressor to just incorporate some of these great, great habits. <laughs>